Okay, this is somewhat of a prequel or a prelude, I guess you could say, to the uh, build for this bat house right here. Uh, I decided uh, from the get-go that I would do this one in details, going through every step, so therefore it's somewhat long. Uh, some people may be more advanced and don't want to see the uh, every step-by-step -step version of it, and for that I'm going to make a... Uh, shorter version so if you are in a, more of an advanced woodworker that would be the one you would want to head for it'll be somewhere in my videos I'll try to get it put up in the next day or two uh, tool wise for this uh, you pretty much do need a table saw or know somebody that has a table saw you don't have to have a router table you don't have to have a miter saw you don't have to have you know quite a few uh, pneumatic tools uh, a lot of these things you don't have to have I use them just because I already have them and it makes uh, the project quite a bit easier and that I'm building more than one of these. Uh, but that's just a little bit of a prelude to this and uh, we'll get on to the video. Hi, I'm Roger and today's project is going to be a bat house. In fact, it's going to be four bat houses. Uh, our daughter asked if, we, if I could make her a bat house and then a friend of theirs wanted a bat house and then one other person wanted a bat house and well I kind of like to have one too. So did some research on them. We, we do have bats around here. They're extremely beneficial. Uh, clear up a few myths uh, that are commonly thought up as uh, bats are attack you. Well they won't unless you grab one and provoke it. It may bite you. If you leave them alone they'll leave you alone. They pretty much try to avoid humans. Vampire bats. There are no vampire bats in the United States. That's a southern Mexico, Central America, and South America thing. And even there, they prefer to feed on uh, rats and cows and pigs. And they, I guess they don't like the taste of human bloods from what I've read. Another thing I was asked about is, well, you know, the, the bats eat insects. And that's one of the reasons that they're honey beneficial. I'm not real fond of mosquitoes. I don't know anybody that is. Uh, they eat a lot of mosquitoes, they eat a lot of cucumber beetles, which uh, the larva is also known as corn rootworms. Uh, the moths that fly at night to lay eggs for your uh, sweet corn, you get worms in the ears. They eat those moths, uh, cabbage moths, they eat those. Uh, and my biggest pet peeve is a brown stink bug. We've got loads of them around here and they seem to get everywhere in the fall. And they will help to keep those populations down. We have a uh, bird, butterfly, honeybee conservation area, I guess you would call it, behind our property. It's probably 10 to 15 acres in size. It's landlocked. The people that take care of it have all natural uh, prairie grasses and prairie flowers that are native to the Midwest and Illinois back there. Uh, it's going to be good bee forage for my hives and it's excellent uh, habitat for the bats as well. Another thing that comes up, uh, and I've already been asked, well, won't the bats eat your bees? Well, no. Uh, when the bats come out, it's usually dusk or almost dark. And by that time, all the bees are snug in their hive and uh, asleep for the night or busy inside. They're not going to be outside flying around in the dark. By the same token, bats don't fly around in the daytime. If you do see one flying around in the daytime, it may be sick or diseased. Uh, Oh, then the other thing comes up is about rabies. You know, well, bats have rabies. Well, there's a very small chance that one could have rabies or be rabbit or carry rabies. Uh, the biggest rabbit rabies carrier around this area are raccoons. And we have lots of those and lots of them. In fact, I can't even grow sweet corn here because of them. Uh, in spite of an electric fence around it, they seem to still find a way through. And they know to get in there just the day before it's ready to pick. Anyway, getting back to the bee houses, uh, did a lot of research, and I will put links to everything in the description below. One of the things you can download is the Bat House Builder's Handbook, and I printed this out and put a comb binding on it so I could use it out here in the shop. It's got a lot of reference material in there too about where to paint your or where to place your bat house, what color to paint it, depending on where you are in the country. And yes, it does make a big difference. Uh, Bats like it hot, but they don't want it too hot. So, good thing to download and good thing to read. Uh, one of the the one I'm going to be making here, actually I'm going to be making four of them, 
is the four chamber nursery house. And like I said, I'll have links for all this in the description below where you can go and download this stuff. Uh, <clears throat> of course, it's winter time right now. I'm not definitely not going to be attracting any bats. I won't put these up till spring. Uh, one of them is going to be a Christmas gift. Yeah, I'm getting a little hard pressed here to get things ready for Christmas, but that's what we're going to do. I've been real busy in here building everything from uh, coasters like this to uh, boards and bo shadow boxes and just all kinds of things. So, been busy. At any rate, <clears throat> as I was saying, uh, not going to get anything here in the winter time. A little bit of fact about bats is that they mate in the fall and the female will carry the sperm until spring and then fertilize the egg in uh, very very early spring and they, she will carry that and give live birth to one pup. Yeah, baby bats are called pups. Uh, another thing that I found interesting in doing my research is that uh, since they generally mate just before hibernation it's also possible for the males to mate with the females even though the females are in hibernation. Yeah, I see a bunch of you guys out there right now going, huh, huh. Okay, I'm going to leave it at that. You can draw your own conclusions. At any rate, uh, one of the first things I need to do here is cut my materials down. Uh, the way these plans are drawn up, a half sheet of half inch plywood and a half sheet of three eighths plywood will build two four chamber nursery bat houses. And you will also need two lengths of one by six, eight foot long. Uh, you can use cedar. I'm going to be using pine since it's going to be painted. Uh, when you're choosing your plywood, absolutely do not use tree to plywood. That, that's no good at all. You need to have an exterior plywood. A uh, grade of CDX is fine, uh, but if you are going to use the CDX, try to find five ply instead of three ply. This goes for the three eighths as well. If you can find five ply, It'll hold up much better, be less apt to warp, it'll be easier to glue and to fasten. Uh, the plywood that I chose for these, yeah, and I actually went out and bought some wood lumber for this. Usually I'm looking for scraps and free stuff, but I had to buy the wood for this one. I bought ACX plywood. Um, that means A grade on one side, it's clear, no knots, it's going to look nice on the, ins on the outside. Uh, the C grade on the uh, inside is a little rough, there's some knots, but the bats don't mind and it's five ply and it's exterior glue that's what the X stands for very important uh, I'm also going to be using glue on these and I'm using tight bond 3 which is a waterproof glue even though it'll be painted and I you don't have to glue this but I intend to and I'll be using uh, hardware will be uh, galvanized one of the things that the uh, bats need is a way to climb up into their nest or into their house and one way to do it is to cut a bunch of very small slots in the wood so they'll have something for their feet to grab onto to crawl up inside the brood box. Uh, yeah, I could do that. I'm certainly set up for it, but my, in my opinion, cutting all the little grooves is going to leave more surface area out there. It would also make it difficult to paint without filling the grooves up. Another option is to use this, uh, it's actually plastic gutter guard and you get a uh, 6 inch by 20 foot roll for 2 bucks and I'll be putting this material, I'll get this opened up here a little bit see what it looks like it's just a, a plastic mesh, it's ultraviolet stabilized um, I've used it on gutters before and it holds up for years and years and years I'll be putting this on with uh, galvanized upholstery staples uh, because I have an upholstery gun but you could use a regular staple gun as well so make sure you use either galvanized or stainless steel staples and you don't want anything to be too long because you don't want it coming out the other side of the wood so you want to keep them fairly short like a 5 16 uh, leg staple and uh, as I get into the build I'll be uh, showing you how I put this on okay I guess the next best thing to do here would be getting down to doing some cutting so be back. Okay, I've got my out table folded up here, out feed table folded up. Uh, the first thing we need to cut are a couple of 17 and a half inch wide by four foot long strips, which will then get cut down again. Each one of those strips, uh, one will be the front and one will be the back. Uh, so we'll get going. I'll cut those four down first.
I should also add that uh, when you're cutting plywood on the table saw, if you don't already know this, use a fine tooth blade. This is an 80 tooth, uh, specifically made for plywood and fine cross cutting. Uh, also thin kerf. I don't need to run a full kerf blade here. The way they have these laid out on the uh, layout sheet on the plans, they didn't really allow for the saw kerf. So uh, these pieces will be fine, but as we cut the next dimension, which is one needs to be 31 and one needs to be 17. Well, 31 plus 17 is 48, but you've got a uh, 332nd saw curve in there too, you got to think about. So, anyway, um, I'll be getting repositioned here and cutting the rest of these down, and we'll be back. Okay, I wasn't going to shoot video of me cutting every one of these parts, but I thought I should uh, bring this up. Uh, on your roof panels, um, let me grab my sheet here. That says, if you're looking at the plans, that'd be this little upper section up here in the corner. So your, it calls for 20 inches long, which this already is. Then it calls for six and a half inches across. You need to cut a 25 degree bevel on there. This does not work out to six and a half. Uh, when you do cut this, it will be about six and three eighths. So if you have a once you have your blade set up at 25 degrees, if your fence is accurate, I mean, if you're not set up for this kind of thing, then actually measure. Mine's set up to be extremely accurate. So I've got my fence set at 6 and 1 eighth. So in that way, cut this one. Okay, that allows for the saw curve. Let's get this flipped around. The Chinese puzzle here. So now you'll end up with two equal pieces, just like that. You have a 25 degree bevel on one side. This is actually the back side of the roof. So when it's sitting like this on the bat house, uh, this will be the back side, and it'll go flush with the back. Uh, the front will overhang a little bit. So I just thought I'd point that out. Uh, like I said, I'm not going to shoot video of me cutting all these pieces up. That's uh, somewhat boring. But uh, I'll get the 3 8 pieces cut up next, and then we'll be back. Okay, we got all our plywood pieces cut. Got them all stacked up here. Uh, the next thing we need to do is cut down the 1x6s. Um, if you <clears throat> have downloaded this plan, in fact, I'll put a link in just for this plan in case you don't want to download the whole book. It'll be down in the description. Next thing we need to do is cut our spacer pieces out of one of the 1x6's. That'll be right here on the, be on the left hand side of the plan. And all the strips are uh, inch and a quarter wide. And then some are 5 inches long, some are 10 inches long, some are 20 inches long. The way this works out is I'll cut my uh, 1x6 down into 20 inch lengths. And then I'll rip the inch and a quarter strips out, and then I can go back and cut the tens and fives out of that. The other one we need to cut down are the end pieces, the sides, I should say, and the roof supports. Uh, there's some bevels involved here and some miters, 25 degree bevels and 25 degree miters. I'll uh, rough cut these, and then uh, I'll do the uh, miters and the bevels afterwards. So I'll get set up here, I'll be back. Thought I could use my stop, but it doesn't work out right.
since I'm only cutting four of these, it's not worth changing it. Okay, because of the pieces that are going to be cut out of this, I'm just going to cut this in half and then I'll uh, do my ripping and uh, we'll do the bevels and uh, miter cuts afterwards. Okay, get set up on the table saw and we'll be back. Okay, you might have remembered here at the beginning of the video I was talking about one of the things that bats eat were stink bugs. And uh, here, here it is in the middle of December and I just switched over put a rip blade in here and what do I find laying on one of my boards? Yep, there we go. It's a damn stink bug. So hopefully we'll get some bats to move into this thing this summer and uh, try to cut down the population of these things. Okay, the next step. On these 20 inch lengths of 1x6, and this one's got a little bit of weighing on it, of course that'll be on the waist side. Uh, I kind of grade them as I go through. You need to rip each one of these four into an inch and a quarter wide strip. Uh, it's 20 inches long, and then when uh, we're done with this, I can go back on the uh, DeWalt saw, or I can do it on here, cross cut too, to cut the 10 inch and 5 inch pieces. This is, I think, is the quickest way to do it, so we'll get ripping here. Uh, I've got my micro jig set up with proper spacing.
so on, you don't need to watch me rip a whole bunch of these up. So once I get all these cut, we'll be back. Okay, next I'll be taking the four foot pieces we cut earlier, and I'll be ripping these down to four and one eighth wide, and from there we cut the uh, miters for the end pieces. So we'll get those cut. Okay, these offcuts right here, we'll need to have a uh, 25 degree bevel on, which uh, I'm probably not going to do today. I'll be doing that tomorrow. It's uh, getting late. I'll probably also cut this miter part tomorrow. But uh, we've got most of the other parts cut. I'm a little bit out of camera view here, but I've got a big pile of parts here. It looks like I've been to IKEA. So some assembly required. Uh, we'll get back to this tomorrow and see you then. Okay, we're back. The next day, um, had a whole bunch of things happen today. My uh, drill press was 22 years old, little bench top model. It took a crap, so I had to go get a new one. Uh, actually, I did a video on that. If you want to see what a Performax drill press is like. Of course, and that new one wouldn't fit on the bench, so I had to uh, rearrange a whole bunch of tools on the bench. And of course, that led to cleaning some stuff up and found tape measures I hadn't seen in a while and all kinds of pencils and um, one serious cutter pin here. Anyway, getting back to the bat house. Okay, I've got the pieces cut on the side pieces, 25 degree angle. If you don't have a way to do that, um, measure up from the end on this side, 23 inches. On the long end, from the bottom up, 25 inches. Draw your line in between, that's a 25 degree angle on there. These are four and an eighth wide. So the pieces left over that we uh, ripped off of those, uh, one by sixes, that's these here, these will be the roof supports. These need to have a 25 degree bevel on one side. So I've set the table saw to 25 degrees and I've set up some feather boards to uh, hold everything down and make this a nice, quick, easy job. Um, once you get your blade tilted to 25 degrees, you want to set your fence at three quarters of an inch. So it'll be three quarters of an inch from the fence to the where the blade comes out the insert. Let me get the camera re-aimed and we'll cut some bevels. Just like that. Okay, this will be our uh, roof support pieces. They'll need to be cut to length. Uh, the sheet here. And 15 and 7 eighths. And I'll do that. Of course, I won't shoot a video of that. I'll do that on the chop saw. Uh, you'll need uh, two of them for each of your bat houses. And speaking of the bat houses, I was out. Uh, 
actually buying a drill press today. I ran into someone I knew and they wanted to know what I was up to and I told them I was building bat houses and they said, well, I'd like to have one, you know, can you build me one? I said, well, yeah, I suppose i got four of them going right now for some other people. Well, can you build mine out of just cedar instead of plywood? Well, yeah, but uh, take a little longer and I may not get to it immediately and in fact that's going to be the subject of another video. You can see right here behind me a whole bunch of cedar fence pickets. That's what I intend to build the uh, next bat house out of. It'll be all cedar and it'll have no metal fasteners in it. Everything will be uh, tongue and groove and dado and mortise and tenon. It'll be uh, kind of a deluxe model but there'll be no metal hardware on it other than the mounting hardware. So anyway, we'll get back to this. I'll get these cut to length and then we'll uh, get ready for start doing some assembly. Okay, got ahead of myself just a little bit. We can't quite do assembly yet. Got a few more uh, cuts to make and a uh, little bit of milling to do. One of the things we need to do yet is on each one of our side pieces is to make this little cutout right here for a vent. It is five inches from the bottom. This is done on the long side. And this slot is six inches long and a half inch deep. I decided to do it on the uh, with a the router. There's different ways you could do it. You can do it with a jigsaw, that cut in and then cut that out. You can do it on a bandsaw. You can do it with a data stack and a table saw and just make multiple passes. I uh, just decided to do it with a router table. So I'll get the uh, camera rearranged over there and I'll show you how this part works. Okay, I've got a stop block on my fence over here. So I'll start here at the bottom and then I'll just work my way down. As I get to the end, I can just lift the piece off. So I'll do one of them here, I'll show you how this works. Just like that, and it does help to have a starting point marked ahead of time. But cut you a nice slot out like that, and I'll go ahead and do the rest of these, and then we'll be back. Okay, this next step is completely optional. You don't need to do this. Uh, what I like to do is to round over my edges a little bit where it's going to be on the outside. And I've also done it here on the vent opening. What I've done, take these as you would face them. The tall end, of course, is the back. The short part will be the front. I marked one left, one right, then I marked outside and outside. That way you keep straight which side's which. You don't want to route the inside, round over the inside edges, and you don't want to round over the roof part. But I, you do want to round over the outside edges where it's, everything's going to be exposed. This will keep things from splintering and also uh, keep you from getting slivers while you're putting things together. I'll uh, re-aim the camera and I'll show you how I do one of them.
and the inside where the van is I do route that over a little bit but just right in that area where there's a could be a little bit of a passageway you may have your hand but you don't it'll keep her from splintering and slivering and etc rest of it that's on the inside I do not round over only on the outside edges okay um, I'm gonna do the rest of these and we'll be back and next I'll be laying out holes for the passageways on the inner partitions okay the next step here is we need to cut some passageway holes in the uh, inner partitions that's to your pieces of 3 8 plywood um, I've laid these out at three inches in and three inches down, it'll be one on each side. You need to do that to all three partitions. Uh, the hole diameter is inch and a half. There's several ways you could do that. You could use a, a hole saw, you could use a spade bit. Um, I intend to use a Forstner bit. If you've never seen one of these, it drills a very smooth hole. Uh, you still want to use a backer board, some kind of scrap underneath, so that when it does come through, you don't have breakout, blowout, or splintering on the back side. But I'll get these set up and I'll probably do all three of these at a time. I'll just clamp them together and do them on the drill press. And we'll get set up and do that. Okay, as you can see here, I've got three of these clamped together. I've got my holes laid out. Inch and a half Forstner bit in the drill press. And just like that we got our passage holes. So I'm going to go ahead and drill the rest of these. I got uh, three more batches of these to do since I'm making four houses in this uh, video. So we'll get that done and I'll be back. Okay next step is we need to put the uh, plastic mesh on each one of the partitions and the backboard. Uh, try to zoom in here on this. Hopefully everything will focus. You can see here I've drawn some pencil lines on this is your outer board which sits over here like this and this next line is where the spacer sits done that on both sides then on the top you've got your roof support and then under that is another little spacer piece so there's a pencil line for that on the partitions I've drawn pencil lines on each side of where the spacers are. So the pieces of mesh you need to cut for the partitions. These are, yeah, a little tangle. These are 20 inches long. They don't go all the way to the top. You've got to keep them just a little shy to be able to get your uh, spacers in there where they need to be. And they'll be two wide. So will be one there and one there. So you'll need six pieces, 20 inches long. Then for the backboard, These will be side by side. It would be nice if it was warmer than 50 degrees in here. But anyway, they'll sit like this side by side and they go all the way to the bottom and then up to your pencil line up here that's below the uh, spacer. Be putting these on with uh, 5 16 stainless steel staples. You can also use galvanized. Uh, I'm going to be using a uh, pneumatic upholstery gun just because I happen to have one. You could also use an electric or you could use a hand stapler staple gun like an Aero T50. And this uh, plastic mesh can be cut with even a pair of dull scissors. Yeah, this can be a little bit fun with this curling up on me. Well, helps if you close the bottom of the staple gun all the way. Put that in my blooper reel.
You want to staple this every two to three inches. This spider there. Now I got to figure out what's going on here with my catch on the back of my gun. Don't seem to be latching like it should. And up at the top here, I see I'm just a hair long. Trim that back. It says cut for Lucy with even dull scissors. And so on. And then this one here will set. Right like that. And then we need to do the same thing in the partition, so I'll get all those on there and then uh, we'll come back and by that time we'll be ready to do some assembly. Okay, a couple things I should add here. Um, when you're putting the mesh on your backboards, make sure you do a cutout for the uh, passageways. Don't cover them up or the bats won't be able to get through. Also on the backboard, this will be the part facing out, of course. And the lower part, from about here down, will be open. If you're going to be painting and using a brush or a roller, most people will, you should paint the backboard before you assemble this, at least the bottom portion of this. Um, I'm going to be spraying, so I won't be clogging these holes up, but if you're using a uh, brush or a roller, you'll want to paint this lower part first. Okay, I'm going to get uh, the rest of my pieces lined up here, and then we'll start doing some assembly. Um, Oh, also on your staples, you can use a hammer tacker if you're accurate. Otherwise, I would use a regular staple gun or electric or a pneumatic stapler like I use. Okay, I'll get all the pieces together here and we'll get set up. We'll put one of these together. Okay, I have this roughly assembled the way it's going to go. Everything is just sitting together here. Nothing is fastened. Just kind of wanted to show a little bit about how this lays out. Um, if you were to look at the plan, some people may be confused by the way it looks. Uh, this, of course, is your roof piece. This is the upper front cover. This is the lower front cover. <clears throat> now I'm going to lay the side down over here so you can kind of see how these pieces layer up. This is your vent opening, so you got your two small spacer blocks here. That leaves your opening for your vent. Then you have a spacer for each one of these. At the top up here is your roof support that will go on the backboard. And you also have one on the front partition. There are little spacers as you can see here and there. I suppose when they designed it they wanted to make the best use of the wood. It's not going to be uh, a big deal as far as structure goes. I mean they're just little tiny spaces. This is how everything lines up you know in a, in a dry fit. I figured I'd lay this out so that uh, somebody that didn't quite understand the way the plans were drawn would be confused. So I'm going to, what I'm going to be doing is using glue and a combination of uh, galvanized staples, galvanized finishing nails, and galvanized brads. These could also be done with uh, deck screws. You could screw this all together. The glue is not necessary, but to me it seals things up better and I also find that a glue joint is going to be stronger than something put together with screws or uh, brads because the, especially with the tight bond 3, that glue joint is actually stronger than the wood is and if you were to actually break that apart, you would break the wood, you would not break the glue joint. So I'm going to get set up here and uh, then we'll start going through the assembly processes. One of the first things we're going to want to do is put the sides on so we can line everything up from there. So I'll get my uh, glue ready and get my uh, air guns ready and we'll get going here. Okay, ready to assemble here. A uh, couple of assembly aids I should probably uh, point out is uh, 
First I'll point out the glue I'm using. It's Type Bond 3. Uh, comes in bottles bigger than this and smaller than this. I generally buy it in this size because uh, I don't like trying to store a gallon and I may not be using a whole gallon at once. And another little handy thing, this is called a glue bot. I've got one of these for uh, each one of my different glues I use, Type Bonds 1, 2, and 3. Uh, this little guy here just pops off and then as you squeeze this, the glue comes out here. This is a great invention. Uh, I think they're, I don't know, five, six, seven bucks are really worth the investment. Another thing that's going to be handy to have are some clamps if you have them. Uh, I don't know if you can see here on this particular board, but there's just a little bit of a bow to it right around through here. And as I put this on, I can use the clamps to uh, compensate for that as I'm putting it in with the staples in. Staples I'm using are uh, inch and a half rosin coated galvanized quarter inch crown. Like I said, you can also use screws. If you're going to use screws, I suggest you drill a pilot hole ahead of time so you don't risk splitting the wood anywhere. Uh, you could also use uh, galvanized finishing nails. Uh, probably a few other different things you could use. But this is the way I choose to do it. Uh, they'll being galvanized, I'm not worrying about rusting, and this will be painted anyway. A lot of what we have is inside, and it'll never be exposed to the weather or moisture. So I'll get set up here and we'll start assembling. Okay, so what we want to do first is put the sides on. It's cold in here, I'm shivering. Why you see me wearing sweatshirts in here? It's only 50 degrees. I'm going to spread that out on there. You don't obviously you don't need anything in the vent. Get a good even coat. The squeeze out is good. That means you got a good joint there. I should also add that the uh, little round over we did earlier is very very subtle. It's it's uh, probably less than a sixteenth. It's just enough to take that sharp edge off the outside. This will align at the very tip. I've also got a line drawn on the inside so I have something to reference to. I want you don't push things off the end of my table. This is where we got that little bow to deal with. That lines everything up. There's our first side. You see I got a little bit of glue squeezed out there, but that's a good thing. It helps seal that real well. Just wipe that off. And I will get the other side mounted, then we'll come back and start doing the spacers and the partitions. Okay, got the two sides on, so the next step would be the uh, upper roof support. I've switched staples to a one-inch staple. If I use an inch and a half, it'll go all the way through. But uh, 
get this glued on and stapled. Yeah, you can also use a glue brush. I like the Ninja method. You want the bevel pointing up, of course, and then the longer point to the back. That lined up. Like so. Then next, we have our spacers that go in here. It will go like so. <clears throat> you want to leave the opening here for the vent. We'll get those glued in and stapled down. I mentioned before the glue isn't necessary, but I feel it makes everything stronger. It also helps seal it up against uh, any kind of leaks. You want to make sure your bottom spacer is above the bottom of the outside board. Spacer does not go all the way to the top. I think, like I said before, I think that would have to do with trying to use the, make the best use of that one eight foot one by six. be a partition. That will set in here like so. And you want to bring it up to the top, but you do not want the plywood to be higher than your bevel you have on here. It will set down just a little bit. In fact, it doesn't go all the way to the bottom either. There's a space down there at the end. So I'm going to pick a couple marks here so I don't put glue down where I don't need it.
Next, you got the spacers again. These go in like so. Man, you're getting glue everywhere here. And don't let the spacer stick up above the top. It's important. Your roof will never fit right. care of that. If that doesn't work, you can always get a bigger hammer. Okay, next we get another partition. And here again you want to make sure that it doesn't get up above the uh, bubbles you have on there. And then we got gaps on each side, we'll take care of that with some clamps. I think to make the best use of the material they didn't allow for saw curves when they drew those plans up. Amount of ammo. Be back in a minute. Okay, more spacers. There again, make sure you don't let it stick up past the end. Good glue coverage there. And more glue and another partition.
that from being past the bevel there. And on our final roof support, which goes right here. I want that to line up with the bevel here. Final spacers. And I see my camera battery is going dead, so I gotta swap batteries. I'll be back, we'll do the front. Okay, got a new battery in there, so we're good to go over there on that. Something I did off camera um, after I changed that battery was I laid my pieces on here and I saw that my two side pieces kind of bowed out a little bit. So I threw a couple clamps on there, it didn't take much to throw it in the square. So laid this on, then I also noticed that up where the front cover goes on and the roof bevel came down, it would leave a little bit of a gap because they did, originally didn't call for a bevel there. I put a 25 degree bevel on the top of that and then while I was over there fooling around I decided to round over all my outside edges. Uh, it's a pretty good eighth inch round over. It's going to give a more of a finished look and also prevent uh, any kind of splinters or splintering or anything. So what I'll need to do next is put these on. There is a gap by design between the upper and lower front covers about like so. It allows for a little ventilation so I will get the glue on here and I'll, you know, I've switched now from staples to uh, inch and a quarter galvanized brads it'll give it more of a finished look and I can actually fill them little holes on the front if I want to. Of course, I'm using Tight Bond 3 here again. Get a good layer all the way around and make a good seal. And again, glue isn't completely necessary. I just feel it makes for a better job. A little bit extra there. The bevel's lined up.
Got a little bit sticking out up there. This will pull that in. That's better. There we have it. All I need to do is let the glue dry. I have to give that a, I'll give it a couple hours before I take the clamps off. Um, the last part to put on would be the roof. And I haven't decided if I'm going to actually use a shingle here or if I'm going to use EPDM rubber. So uh, I'm going to give that a little thought here for a few minutes and probably have a little bit of liquid refreshment. We'll be back. Okay, the next step will be the roof panel. I'll let the glue dry and everything, and I'm all satisfied with that. Uh, I did take this over to the router table, and uh, I rounded these edges over on the front and the sides on both top and bottom. It gives a little bit more of a finish look, and there again, I'll keep the room getting splinters. The bevel side, I didn't do anything with. Uh, this fits pretty well. I've got a sp spacer board under here, so I can make sure this is absolutely flat when I staple it on. Uh, this could be covered with either a shingle or uh, a granulated tar paper type roofing or it could be covered with EPDM roofing which is uh, commercial rubber roofing. I have to have quite a bit of that. I never, still haven't decided how I'm going to finish this up. Or it could be uh, covered with truck bed liner. I've seen that done on birdhouses. I don't see why you couldn't do it on uh, a bat house. But all I need to do is uh, Make some marks here to even my two sides out and put some glue on and staple that on. About an inch and a quarter on each side overhang.
there we have it, one bat house. Ugh. I guess that's as far as that zooms out, but it's just like that. Color, um, obviously these are going to be painted. It depends on what part of the country you're in. Uh, we'll be using, uh, I'll try to be using a dark brown on this. Because we are in the upper Midwest. If you are in uh, the north, you'll want to paint it black. If you're in the like in the southwest, you'll want it a light color. Uh, but we've got three more of these to put together, and then uh, we'll be back. Okay, we got our bat house built. Uh, obviously, it needs to be painted yet, but uh, here's something. Uh, just a little bit of an extra. I wanted to jazz it up a little bit. So broke out the scroll saw here and made a pattern of a bat. And that's going to go on the front here somewhere. I haven't decided quite where yet. Uh, this is just a pattern. And what I've done then is uh, cut one out of some half inch plywood that was actually a scrap left over from uh, the build here. So. I'll be making, uh, well, three more of these anyway, but this kind of an idea. I haven't decided if I'm going to put uh, eyeballs on it yet or not. Tell me what you think. At any rate, like I uh, had mentioned before, with the color that you paint this is going to be dependent on where you are in the country. Um, there's a lot of uh, resources out there, but in general, if you're in an area in the like in the southwest or the desert or in the deep south, you may want to have a lighter color. Uh, in the Midwest and uh, upper Midwest and across a lot of the country, you want a dark to medium dark color. And if you are in the north, you definitely want to have black or very dark brown. Uh, there's lots of uh, resources on the internet you can do some research on. Also with placement, uh, for the most part, it wants to, you want to have it in full sun and out where it has a south exposure and it, if possible sheltered from the wind. Mounting it on a tree is not a good idea because of predators. If it could be put up on a pole or on the side of a building facing south, that's uh, some of the best places. If you do download that uh, bat building handbook that I mentioned at the beginning of the video, that there's a link down below. You can find out more information on that. Otherwise, uh, that's it for the build on this one. We thank you for watching. If you liked what you saw, please give it a thumbs up. And of course, we're always looking for subscribers, and your comments are welcome. Thanks for watching.